about is lanternflies. It's an insect that's um, new to Pennsylvania, and we've been talking a lot about it, so I'm trying to get you some accurate information. So today's agenda, I'm going to talk about the spotted lanternfly, what it is exactly, um, some identification, life cycle, how it impacts us, and then a lot of different ways that you can help stop or slow down the spread of our spotted lanternfly. Um, and this is by reporting sightings, checking your vehicle before you travel, scraping egg masses, making tree traps on your property, and um, you could also plant a garden. So the spotted lanternfly is an insect. Uh, it's not a fly, and it's not a moth or a butterfly. It's actually in the plant hopper group. So it's in the true bugs family, so it's related to like stink bugs. <laughs> and other like little plant hoppers. Um, it is also an invasive species. So this means that it came from another area, it could be another country, another continent, it could just mean that it came from the west coast. And it came to this area fairly recently, in recent history anyway, and it is causing problems. There are other species that have moved here and are not causing problems. To call it invasive means it is causing problems to us as humans or to the environment, or both. So I'm going to play a little um, quick video for you to give you an overview of what the spotted lanternfly is. He's going to talk really fast. Don't worry about digesting everything, so we're going to go through it more slowly. If you live along the East Coast, you probably have. The spotted lanternfly is an invasive species native to certain parts of Asia that feeds on over 70 different plants, especially Ailanthus altissimo, otherwise known as the tree of heaven. These unwelcome guests are more than just a nuisance to plants. They pose a substantial threat to Pennsylvania's hardwood exports, apples, peaches, grapes, wine, and beer. According to a Penn State report, they could drain Pennsylvania's economy of at least $324 million annually. The life cycle of the lanternfly starts in late spring, when the eggs hatch as nymphs. They cannot fly and swiftly hop, climbing trees that feed on more tender plant growth. As they develop, they become bright red, adding to their natural black markings and white spots. In summer, they shed their exoskeleton and grow into adults with wings. Spotted lanternflies cannot bite and have piercing, sucking mouth parts, which are designed for plant feeding. They wound trees to eat tree sap and excrete honeydew, a sticky, sugary substance that encourages sodium mold fungi. This will attract wasps and other insects. Long-term health of the infested tree is damaged, and the surrounding plants are also at risk. In early fall, the females begin to lay eggs in rows on any surface. One lanternfly can lay at least one to two egg masses that contain 30 to 50 eggs each. Most of the eggs are covered in a white secretion that turns to mud color and eventually cracks. Eradicating this invasive species is a monumental task. There are no natural predators here to truly help deplete the growing population. It is up to us as a community to take action. Penn State offers many resources for homeowners to combat the growth on your property. Together, we can make a difference in containing this destructive pest. Thanks for watching. Okay, so there are a lot of um, a lot of things they mentioned in that video. We're going to break that down a little bit. So our spotted lanternfly originally came from Asia, specifically China. Some sources um, mention other countries in Asia where it might be native to. Back in Asia, the spotted lanternfly isn't a problem because it has natural predators there. It's just now that it's come to a new place, there are new natural predators, the population is just getting out of control. and. Um, we just want to make sure we understand what will happen when when they when the population goes up. So here in Pennsylvania.
Pennsylvania, they were first reported in 2014 in Berks County, so over in the southeast Pennsylvania. Even though it was reported in 2014, uh, they believe they were arrived two or three years earlier based on how old the egg masses were and how big the population was. Uh, but as you can see, since then it's spread across the strait. Anything with um, color in the state is within a quarantine zone and they have spotted lanternflies. Um, the more reddish color counties were added just this year. And the quarantine is kind of like an awareness campaign. It's not like someone's going to pull you over and make sure you don't have spotted lanternflies on you. Um, for us, like as individuals, um, Penn State Extension provides a checklist to make sure that you are looking for spotted lantern flies in um, hidden areas on your car or even camping materials if that's what you're moving around. Just to make sure we're not spreading it to new areas. We're just trying to slow it down so that researchers have time to learn about them, to um, research management methods so that we can best handle, handle this new species. Um, for businesses, um, the quarantine means that they need to get a permit. It's kind of like an educational permit to prove that they have educated their staff about the spotted lanternfly and how to spot them. It's a free permit. Again, this is more like a, a, an awareness so that we slow that spread. They've also spread without Pennsylvania at this point, so there is a lot of the surrounding states like Virginia and Maryland. And they've started their own uh, management strategies. So the first step in helping to stop the spread of our spotted lanternflies is to learn what they look like. Um, they look different at different uh, stages in their life, as you can see up here, and we'll go through each one a little more slowly. So when they first hatch, which is right around now, um, they are going to be teeny tiny. Some people mistake them for ticks. That's how small they are, but really small. Um, about a quarter inch long, they're black with white spots. Uh, they're strong jumpers, but that kind of goes for all stages of its life. They're in the tree hopper uh, group for a reason. They, if they're startled, they might just kind of jump. So be ready for that. <laughs> um, and this is in the first to third instar. Instar is um, a scientific term for a lot of insects because while they're growing, their exoskeleton doesn't grow with them. So you can think of it kind of like a snake how that sheds its skin. As the insect's growing, they have to break through that exoskeleton and um, molt. They come out a little bit bigger and their new exoskeleton will harden and sometimes it will change colors. So the first three times it molts, it just gets a little bit bigger, but it looks the same. The fourth time that it breaks through its exoskeleton, it will turn red. So this is around like July when they start turning red. Uh, they're a little bit bigger, about three quarter inches long. Um, and then their last molt, they will become an adult with wings. These guys are about an inch long. They have pinkish tan wings with spots. Um, a lot of pictures show them with the red coloration on the underwings. They really don't sit like that very often. You'll most likely find them with their wings folded. You will not see that red color. So don't um, use that as a major identifying feature. I have some specimens here that you can pass around. You can Thank see you. the different um, different ways it looks. There is a male and female on there. 
And here's how you can identify a male versus a female. So we're looking at the underside of the insect, the very tip of the abdomen. Um, on the male, it's just all black. On the female, they have she has this red part on her, and this has something to do with um, egg laying. So it's like the female genitalia there. And another way you can tell male versus female is that when the females are pregnant, when they are ready to lay <laughs> their eggs, her abdomen gets really swollen. Um, both males and females have yellow with black striping on their abdomen, but the female will get nice and swollen when she is ready to lay those eggs. You can also see she's got that, that red part on her at the bottom of her abdomen. And then of course we have our egg masses. He'll, he'll grab our so is the which one is the male and which one is the female? So um, the female is on the bottom. We can pass around again if you want to look. If you look really carefully underneath, you can't see the red at the bottom of her abdomen. Okay. One of the few instances where the female is bigger than the male. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so right now we will see some of those black, those that first instar of the juveniles, but most of what you're seeing right at this moment will be egg masses. They um, only the eggs survive the winter, and all the other stages of life will die. Uh, the egg masses look like it's an inch long of putty or clay or mud. It's just like a smear on any hard surface, so leather eggs <laughs> seems like almost anything. Um, towards the end of the winter, early spring, that smear is going to look more like old, dry, cracked mud. So it kind of it ages a little bit differently. So at the beginning um, of the winter, you're looking for something a little more moist and solid looking, and then at the, towards the end of winter, or right now, it might be cracked the eggs itself might be completely exposed. Um, like right here, you can see kind of each individual egg exposed. And there'll be uh, 30 to 50 eggs in each mass. So here's the life cycle. Went over it a little bit while we were talking. Uh, right now, they are still in their eggs. Starting in May, you'll get your first hatchlings and they will be black until around July when they go into their fourth instar when they turn red. So around midsummer you'll start seeing the red ones <coughs> and also around midsummer you'll start seeing adults. And you'll see adults and they'll be laying eggs all the way until around December. And then they'll be just eggs over the winter time. So how does this impact humans? Why do we care? Why is there so much hype about this one insect? Uh, it's important to a lot of people to know that they do not harm us. They don't bite us. They don't sting us. They don't harm us in any direct way. But they do harm some of the things that we care about, like our beer um, with the hops, our um, potentially our apples, peaches, grapes, And this is because of the way that they eat. So we're looking directly at its face. You can see two orange bumps. Those are their antenna, which are really kind of strange. I've never, never seen an antenna quite like that. Um, but they have this long beak down in front. It's like a giant straw attached to their face. And um, they eat by uh, piercing into plants and sucking out the sap. <laughs> they are looking for um, nutrients like nitrogen and amino acids that are in plant sap, but there's not very much in there, so they need to drink a lot. And if you're drinking a lot, you're going to be having to come out the other end a lot. 
So they are making something called honeydew. Other insects do this. Um, it's just basically sugar water coming right out, out of them. Um, and this can cause some issues, like attracting wasps, like they said in the video. Um, wasps and other insects are attracted to sugary material. Uh, so this can be a little bit annoying in your backyard. Uh, and sooty mold will grow on honeydew. Sooty mold is black. If you look in this picture, um, this is a set of stairs. The two top stairs are covered with black, shiny stuff. That's sooty mold. And this bottom step has been power washed. And they were saying that the sooty mold can be really slippery. It's really hard to get off. So if you have a car or anything under those trees, um, it could get sooty, sooty mold on them. And then, of course, our agriculture um, has the potential to have an impact on our agriculture because um, if, if they're um, sucking all the sap out of the plant, it might be stressing out the plant, causing wilting. Um, it's, Sooty mold is growing on the leaves. They can't do photosynthesis, so those leaves will be under stress. Well, the whole plant will be under stress. Um, and also, if sooty mold is growing on any fruits, um, that could decrease the market value of that fruit. Now, luckily, <laughs> uh, so far there hasn't been too much impact on agriculture. They were really worried, but the um, chemicals, insecticides they already were using seems to work for our spotted lanternflies. So unless it was a really high population of spotted lanternflies, um, they haven't had significant damage. So that's really good news. We want to keep it that way. <laughs> um, I think the biggest issues have been with um, homeowners having kind of annoyances in their backyard. So there are some things you can do to help to make sure um, the damage stays down the way that it has been. So again, you can report sightings, you can check for them before you leave, scrape egg masses, you can make tree traps, and you can plant a garden. So let's go through some of these. So if you see one, if you're in a county outside of the current quarantine zone, you can report it to Penn State Extension by going to their website. <coughs> across the bar here, it's taking a long time to load. I apologize. But across the top here, you can see the picture of the spotted lanternfly. And it will, oh here, and um, that's where you can report the spotted lantern fly. You click right here, it'll take you to a page where you can, um, it'll show some pictures so you can click on exactly what you found. And when you click on that, it'll take you to a map and you can uh, pinpoint where you saw it and it'll ask you for your information. So if they need to contact you, they can do that. Because especially if you're outside of a quarantine zone and you found one, they're going to want to contact you so they, they can go to the exact location and confirm that sighting. Something else that you can do is to check for spotted lantern flies before you travel, especially if you're going to go outside of your own county. And Penn State Extension again offers a really great resource, a checklist for all the different places where they tend to find spotted lantern flies, um, including like the wheel of your car in the windshield wiper kind of gap or any kind of nooks and crannies um, 
in your car, you can check and make sure there's nobody hiding in there so we're not moving it to a new county. Also on their checklist, they have um, some of the common places they've seen egg masses. So you can really see they will lay their eggs anywhere, <laughs> anywhere that's a hard <laughs> surface. Even on your camping chairs, on your wheels, fence posts, pillows. Um, so just be mindful and uh, <coughs> keep an eye out before you are traveling. Now if you find an egg mass, you can scrape it off. So here's the egg masses again. Remember they look like little smears of mud. At this point in time they are going to look cracked. <coughs> And old, they may even be exposed. And um, the most helpful time to do egg scrapings is going to be late fall all the way until right now. That's when the eggs are most likely to be viable. Um, the rest of the year, they should already be hatched. So this wouldn't be quite as effective the rest of the year. I'm going to show a video of the uh, proper <laughs> egg scraping technique. And I'll let him explain why. I just want to make sure you caught it, that you need to actually kill the eggs, like smush them or put them in alcohol, because if you just scrape it directly onto the ground, they'll still be viable and they can still hatch.
before, um, we can still be scraping eggs right now, but you can also start thinking about juveniles and adults. <coughs> Um, and you can create a tree trap in order to um, capture and kill juveniles and adults. Um, and the same sort of trap should be effective for both. So here's uh, the sticky tree trap, or the sticky band tree trap, uh, which is basically like flypaper or a ring of flypaper around the tree with a netting on top. Now this works because the uh, adults will be on kind of the more woody part of the tree, just sucking the uh, sap out of the trunk and the woody branches, and then the juveniles will be up in like the leaves, the more delicate, easy to penetrate areas. But they'll both be up high in the tree and with a strong wind, they'll get blown to the ground. <laughs> so then they have to start walking back up the tree. So when they're walking up the tree, we can take advantage of that known behavior in order to trap them on sticky tape um, while they're walking up. Now we've had some issues with the sticky tape. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a woodpecker. This woodpecker arrived at Raven Ridge Wildlife Center in rough shape, still stuck to a piece of lanternfly trap. Shaylin McComsey spotted the bird on the sticky tape that's wrapped Sorry, around a number that. of trees in the family's backyard. I was like, oh my god, I don't know how he got on there. Shaylin cut the tape off with the bird attached as advised and called a rescue organization. It delivered it to Raven Ridge. I work as fast as I can to get them off of the tape. Raven Ridge director Tracy Young got to work freeing the bird after giving it some pain medication. Stress out. Tracy uses a special solution to break down the adhesive, which was covered with other insects. Okay. She got it loose after about five minutes, but the bird has broken wings and lost tail feathers. Tracy says this is a common occurrence. This owl is also recovering after getting stuck on tape. There are so many animals that utilize the trees. I just don't know who thought this was a good idea. If you are going to put up the tape around your trees, it's recommended that you put this screening material over it. That way the lanternflies can get under it, but the birds and other animals will go over it. It's fairly inexpensive, um, but it could potentially save a lot of animals' lives. The woodpecker was put into an incubator to rest and will be given fluids. It's doing pretty well and hopefully will soon be able to fly off. Susan Shapiro, WGAL, News in. It's a woodpecker. Oh, sorry. Um, so, as you saw in the video, it is very, very important that you add that netting on top of the sticky bands. Um, originally, um, that was not included in the original design. Um, and this is another reason why you want to make sure you're going to reputable sources to look up um, what kind of traps you're putting on your trees or what kind of insecticides you might be using um, so you're not endangering other animals and insects in the process. So if you decide to use this sort of trap, you want to make sure that you add on um, some kind of screen, like a flexible window screen. Um, you want to make sure that it's about three times as long as the sticky band that you're using. So it's lots of protection coverage. Um, as you'll see in the picture, it's pleated. They kind of bunched it up as they were uh, attaching it to the tree. And that helps it um, bow out away from the sticky tape. Um, when you're using that sticky tape, try to use um, five or four inches in width or smaller. That helps reduce the chance of another animal getting attached that we don't want to get attached. And then you want to make sure you're checking it every day. So if something does get attached, you're of it quickly. So if something does get attached to your trap, um, Penn State Extension, um, this is their exact wording, they don't want you to handle it. You don't want to hurt the animal or yourself in the process. So don't try to remove it yourself. Um, you'll want to cover up the rest of the stickiness with saran wrap or something to help 
so nothing else gets stuck to on the animal that's not already stuck. And then very carefully cut the band off of the tree, and then you can put it in a box or something like that so that it feels safe and stable and take it to a wildlife rehabilitator. Um, you can look up reha rehabs um, online. Um, there are some in this area. I just want to, it depends what kind of animal it is um, to where not every rehab takes all animals. So you want to make sure you contact them before, before you take them there. Hopefully we can prevent this from happening. There's another type of trap that has um, come out pretty recently called the circle trap. They completely get rid of the stickiness. <laughs> um, and it's more like a funnel made out of netting. So um, the juveniles and adults, as they're climbing, they get funneled up into the netting and they end up in a bag or some kind of container. And all of these uh, traps can be made with materials you might find around the house or you can easily purchase at Home Depot. There are a few organizations that are selling kits, so you can just buy all the materials all at once. And then there are um, videos online that at a Penn State Extension, and I think Lancaster Conservancy had some great videos that showed you how to assemble it and attach it to the tree. Because this trap is a little bit more involved, so it might <laughs> benefit from the how-to video. Alright, so if you want to take your tree trap and just bring it up to the next level, you can involve a tree called Tree of Heaven. Now this tree is also, um, like the Latin name is Ilanthus, or the scientific name is Ilanthus. This is another invasive species, it's an invasive tree, also from Asia, that the spotted lanternflies go crazy for. This is a preferred host. If um, this tree is around, they're all going to flock to that tree. And we can use that, again, to our advantage. So if you have a um, tree of heaven on your yard, you can try to get rid of all of them except for a small cluster. And then once all the um, spotted lantern flies concentrate in that one area, that's where you can put your tree traps and really get the best bang for your buck, I guess, and <laughs> get a lot of um, spotted lantern flies that way. Um, and this is one of the strategies that um, forestry managements are using. Um, and they kind of hit two birds with one stone, they get all the spotted lantern flies, and they can get rid of all the tree of heaven all at once, <coughs> since they seem to like each other. Uh, if you're trying to identify tree of heaven, some uh, pointers is that it looks very similar to walnut tree or uh, sumac. They have compound leaves, so you can see this long stem with a bunch of leaves coming off of it. That's actually one leaf. So you've got this stem with a whole bunch of leaflets that make one big leaf. Um, if you break off one of the leaves or if you break off an entire branch, it should break off really easily. It just bloop, snaps right off, even if it's a big branch. They usually snap off really easily, and if you give it a, give it a whiff, it'll smell like bitter, old, nasty peanut butter. I love <laughs> peanut butter, but <laughs> this is like gross peanut butter, so um, that should help you with identifying our spot, our uh, tree of heaven. Um, one little uh, fun little theory, one research project I heard about going on was that um, they're thinking that the spotted lantern fly might get a bitter sort of taste from Tree of Heaven, kind of the same way that monarchs get their toxicity from eating milkweed. The spotted lantern fly might get some sort of protection from eating the um, Tree of Heaven, getting like giving it sort of a bitter taste. I did not hear the results from this study. I just thought it was really interesting. So I'd love to hear. Um, to hear, learn more about it, see if that's true. Um, so there are some natural predators out there. Uh, they're slowly popping up. Uh, it doesn't seem like any one natural predator 
has the power to really control the population yet. Uh, but that's why we're trying to slow the spread so we can keep learning about it. Uh, there is a fungus out there attacking our spotted lantern fly. There is a wasp out there that lays its eggs in the spotted lantern fly and does eventually kill it. There are other um, predators, including birds. Um, we've had pictures of owls eating them, um, praying mantises, spiders. Now these are the kinds of things you could help attract to your yard by planting a garden. So again, you can turn to Penn State Extension. They have a lot of great resources um, on their website that can give you a list of plants that will attract certain uh, helpful insects, like predatory insects, like those praying mantises. Um, that seem to enjoy eating the spotted lantern flies. You could plant a garden to attract birds um, who seem to like eating spotted lantern flies. Uh, there was a graduate student who did a research project. Um, she asked citizen scientists around the state of Pennsylvania to send in pictures of um, different natural predators eating spotted lantern flies, and she got it was around 800 submissions, and um, she organized all the different predators. Um, most of them were praying mantises, um, and a lot of them were chickens. So <laughs> if you want to, you could also have a small flock of chickens in your backyard. That might make a difference. Well, this is... Um, it takes me there, Penn State Extension, just one of their articles about um, gardening. They have a master gardener program there, so they have people trained to answer your questions. So if you just want to talk to somebody, um, I recommend talking to the master gardeners at Penn State Extension. Uh, they can get you all kinds of resources. There's a lot of information out there about the spotted lantern fly. I wanted to give you three very reputable uh, resources to turn to if you have questions. Penn State Extension has an incredible amount of information, an incredible amount of resources. Almost all the handouts I have for you today are um, complements of Penn State Extension. I think everything except for the uh, origami. <laughs> um, and of course, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and the United States Department of Agriculture. And as this insect has been spreading to other states, other universities and extension offices have been picking this up. Um, but I think Penn State seems to have the most information right now, which makes sense because we, we're the ones with the, uh, with the most of the insect population. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here today, um, helping uh, pr protect against the spotted lanternfly will help protect our park. We want to keep it a pleasant place to live, it's a beautiful park, we don't want it <laughs> completely infiltrated with spotted lanternflies so that you can continue loving and enjoying our park and all the parks around here. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, it's a phone number or email that is up there.